it's interesting because vaccines used to be thought as not very profitable. You know, the pharmaceutical industry, much, much larger. People, when they're sick, of course, will have a perception that, you know, they'll pay more because, you know, they're, they're, they're worried about, uh, about being sick and wanting to get better. There's nothing that's more driving than when you, you feel sick to get, to get treatment. And so, and vaccines used to be seen as public health commodity things, things that were, you know, required by the state, relatively inexpensive. And, and that's beginning to change. There's been a series of vaccines over the last few years that have come out that have come out at high price in the West and have created very large markets. But the pharmaceutical markets, and you know, over the last couple of decades, have been looking for blockbusters. They've been looking for you know drugs and, and vaccines that make billions of dollars. And so that hadn't been you know the the way of working. On top of that, you have a disease that is extremely difficult scientifically. We've talked about that. You got a disease that the primary place where it's spreading, 95 percent of the infections are in the developing world. And third, you got a disease that's politically controversial. It's about sex. It's it's there are people who are arguing about this. It's about intellectual property. And so, you know, you can rationally see why a company might say this isn't the best place to invest our shareholders' resources. And so one of our great challenges has been to say, this is a global public good. This vaccine will be important not only for the developing world, but also for the developed world. So how do we create incentives that will engage the best scientists, the best companies, the best groups in the world to focus on this problem? It isn't going to happen in a natural market mechanism. We've got to create them, and that's really part of what we're trying to do. In a sense, if you, the, the mechanisms people usually do for these types of products is, you know, people presume there's a massive market out there that can charge a lot of money and therefore there's a lot of profit that can occur. And if it's so profitable that, you know, you can make a real killing on a product, what that means is that you can have lots of products that don't make it along the way and still have it be a profitable business. So, in essence, you know, companies and scientists and groups have to think about, you know, the probability of success of creating products and factor that into what the potential, you know, return on investment is going to be. And that's how the calculations are made. So you have this situation now where you've got a product that may be for a place that isn't going to pay a lot of money, um, that is scientifically difficult, all these controversies. And so if you want to try to get more work done, there are two major mechanisms, push and pull. The push mechanism is you can say, all right, we're not going to expect private companies to pay for the research. We're going to use public dollars to pay for the research. Um, and that's one way to drive things forward. But there's also the possibility of creating a pull mechanism. You could say, we're going to put incentives in place, whether it be we'll take the risk out by funding the research, but also we can create an artificial market, and that's what an advanced market commitment is. That's a, the idea that you put some money out there and you say we're going to create a market that says we'll buy a vaccine at a certain price up to a certain you know, quantity so that the companies know this market is there for the developing world, for the places that they're discounting. Um, there's also tax credits. There's also prizes. There's a whole range of other incentives one can put in place. But the idea is to make sure that you get the best scientists engaged in this. Some of those are going to be in the public sector, you know, government laboratories, academic laboratories. But a lot of this type of vaccine development work occurs in private companies. And so you want to bring those two together. And, and that's the idea of a public-private partnership is to make sure you get the best of both sectors engaged in this. There are now, um, IAVI was the first of these drug type of, of product development partnerships. There's now, um, you know, 20 odd uh, ones of these working in the, the drug and vaccine area. And there's more drugs that are moving forward now but for diseases of poverty than have been moving forward in, you know, the last three or four decades. So there's been, in a sense, a whole renaissance of of movement towards these new types of products. Um, but, you know, product development partnerships, in essence, are not just things that are done in, 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 in the health sector. Um, some of the most interesting academic, you know, uh, uh, product things have been like, you know, the semi, uh, semitech, you know, the, sem the semiconductor type work, uh, um, uh, government um, industry partnerships like the Airbus Consortia, where they've, you know, taken public and private sector and put them together to drive things forward. So it's a, it's a well-known tool. It just hasn't been done for you know, uh, drugs and vaccines for diseases of poverty.